This tradition in China is at least two and a half thousand years old. It has um, Taoist, Buddhist, and Confucian roots. The Taoist roots, I would say, are the strongest. Um, it's a very broad tradition. It ranges from what we would call meditation, which is of nowadays in China often called sitting qigong, right through to smashing bricks over your head. So it's a pretty enormous range of practices. And it's practiced for different reasons, for uh, spiritual connection or transcendence, um, for achieving immortality, ha ha, um, maintaining health, <laughs> curing disease, uh, lengthening life, developing martial and sporting uh, skill. This is a scroll found in a Chinese tomb dating from the 2nd century BC of people performing various kinds of qigong. This is the Yellow Emperor's Classic, the Bible of Chinese medicine, which relates the, f the external physical body to the internal organs in an important way with these quite um, acerbic observations, which should serve as an inspiration or a wake-up call to us. As for the back, it's the palace of that which is in the chest. That means the lung and heart. When the back is curved and the shoulders drop, the palace will soon be destroyed. As for the lower back, it's the palace of the kidneys. When a person is unable to turn the waist and sway, his kidneys will soon be worn out. As for the knees, they're the palace of the sinews. When a person can't freely bend and stretch and needs a stick to walk, his sinews will soon be worn out. As for the bones, they're the palace of the marrow. When a person can't stand for long and while walking staggers back and forth, his bones will soon be worn out. Those who are able to maintain strength, they live. Those who fail to main strength, maintain strength, they die. Huh? So it's pretty clear. That's why still in China, you go out in Hong Kong, in China, you go out in the early morning and you see over China millions of old people doing things to, to maintain muscular strength. It used to be all Tai Chi and Qigong. Uh, they, for political reasons, they've had a checkered history, fell out of power, uh, fell out of um, prominence. So now you get lots of ballroom dancing and backward walking and um, they have gyms in parks and all kinds of strange activities. Uh, but the main idea is absolutely embedded in Chinese culture, of course, of course, as you age, you must maintain body strength. You must do. Otherwise, you're going to decline so rapidly. Yeah? Uh, I once heard a gerontologist, Western medicine gerontologist on the radio a few years back say, what we used to think were diseases of aging, we now understand are diseases of inactivity. So there's a very substantial body of evidence now on the multiple health effects of practices such as Tai Chi and Qigong. So um, I want to look at five core principles of this practice. Integrating body, breath and mind. Integrating yin and yang. Stopping before completion. Free flow and heaven, earth, and human. So integrating body, breath, and mind, four factors. Awareness and alignment, harnessing the mind to treat disease, proper breathing, and meditation. This is a lovely old Taoist classic, little known from the fourth century BC, 
when your body is not aligned, the inner power will not come. When you're not tranquil within, your mind will not be well ordered. Align your body, assist the inner power, then it will gradually come on its own. Awareness and alignment, we talked about um, a lot of these uh, desirable qualities. The mind is still and absorbed in the body and in the practice. There's awareness of breathing, of posture and of movement. Good proprioception, softening and relaxation, groundedness with strength and so on. It's very much um, within the Qigong tradition that you can use the mind, mental activity, to heal the body by focusing on areas of the body that hurt, sometimes by repetition of words or phrases. The Chinese are very fond of, for example, standing meditation where they're repeating things like, I am calm, I am healthy, um, and I am beautiful. <laughs> Every day I get younger, you know, all kinds of <laughs> things like that. And smiling. And that's really interesting because smiling, um, this is something my Qigong teacher emphasizes. When you're doing something really hard, when you're working in Qigong really hard, because some of the work is physically demanding, smile. Huh? Don't grimace. Smile. And um, this, I don't know if you know this guy, Buddhist teacher. Um, sometimes your joy is the source of your smile. But sometimes your smile can be the source of your joy. And what's really interesting is that smiling operates a feedback loop. Because we smile when we feel um, happy, we can induce those feelings when, uh, quite deliberately by smiling, especially when things are getting hard. Breathing. Zhuangzi. Uh, does anybody know Zhuangzi? Yeah, another great. Taoist um, text from the third century BCE. The perfected, that means the sages, breathe all the way to their heels, unlike ordinary folk who breathe only as far as their throats. So breathing is a really important part of Qigong practice. The aim is, to take, is for the breath to be slow, to be long, never forced, never forced into long breath, encouraged. We encourage and train our breathing without tension or effort to be slow, to be deep, to be long, and to go right down to pack the lower back and sides and deep inside the belly. This is Qigong breathing. The chest is quiet. The chest doesn't inflate. The chest is quiet and still and the breathing goes down. And we know now that this type of breathing stimulates what's called the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve connects a lot of the internal organs to the brain. And it enhances parasympathetic activity. So I'll just briefly, in case you've forgotten your school <laughs> biology lessons, we have an autonomic nervous system, which is um, divided into two parts, a yang part and a yin part. Yes? We have a sympathetic part, which is called fight or flight response. So whenever anything, whenever we're threatened, we bang into the sympathetic state. Yeah? All kinds of physiological changes occur in the body and ready to fight or to run. Okay? And the parasympathetic state is the opposite state. It's called the rest and relax state. Yes? Um, and that's when we're feeling chilled. And what a lot of people nowadays in the modern world, it is argued, and I think there's evidence for it, a lot of people live in the stressed parasympathetic state a lot of the time. Um, so when we do this slow, deep breathing, this promotes and trains the parasympathetic um, nervous system. So even in the midst of effort, and even in the midst of demand, we maintain quietness and calmness internally and slow deep breathing. The effect of mental calmness in the midst of effort 
and slow deep breathing is to develop a really effective parasympathetic nervous system. Rest and relax, chilled nervous system. What does that mean in daily life? It means we spend more of our time walking around relaxed. And when we do need, as we will do in life, to kick into the uh, fight or flight mode, we only stay in it as long as necessary. And we very quickly revert back. And also we don't jump into it too quickly because what happens if you jump too quickly into the sym sympathetic fight and flight? You don't see things clearly. You don't see what's going on. Imagine being in a very dangerous situation and still having a few seconds to assess it and realize if I'm gonna flee, where's the best place to flee to? If I have to fight, how am I going to go about it? Huh? So this is a trained um, parasympathetic nervous system which does us no end of good. Breathing also lowers yang. This is a, a Chinese medicine concept. As human beings age, we find that a design fault in the human body starts to manifest more and more strongly. And that's that the energy of the body accumulates, goes up and accumulates above. Huh? So we get, as we age, we get dizziness, too much energy up. We get high blood pressure. We get strokes, uh, all kinds of problems. And the energy abandons the lower body. Our legs become weak. Our feet become weak. We lose connection with the earth. Our balance suffers. We get an imbalanced body. You understand that? So we want to root downwards. And there's lots of ways of rooting downwards. We root downwards physically in the way that we stand and the way that we move. But breathing helps take the chi down and is part of rooting and taking all this energy back down the body. That's what happens when yang rises too much. Um, but it don't, doesn't only have a physical effect. It has an effect on the mind, which I've described. This slow, deep breathing roots the mind and the emotions. Can you understand the idea? You have in Chinese medicine this idea that um, the kidneys down below hold the energy of the heart. Kidneys are water, heart is fire. Huh? The tendency of heart fire is to blaze. And when heart fire blazes, we get anxious, we get nervous, we get sleep problems. Huh? So we need to cool and calm the, the fire of the heart. And this is done through rooting, through taking the breath down. It's partially done by taking the breath down. And this is why increasingly in um, Western medicine, they advise slow abdominal breathing for anxiety, nervousness, insomnia, and so on. The final part of integrating body and mind is the meditation aspect. And meditation, let's call it mindfulness, the buzzword, is as we practice, part of our intention is for our mind to be fully absorbed in the practice. Not roaming around thinking about past and future. Fully present and absorbed in the body and the breath. So this is a form of meditation. And what we know now about meditation is it has physical effects on the brain. The brain is now understood to be what's called plastic. They didn't, didn't used to know this, but the brain can change. This was first discovered in London taxi drivers. I don't know if you knew this. They looked at the brains of London taxi drivers who'd uh, done the knowledge, learned all these books full of London roads, and they found certain areas of the brain were much bigger than other people. So they now know the brain is plastic and can change, and meditation and mindfulness causes certain regions of the brain to grow, particularly regions associated with emotional self-regulation. So we get better and better at um, maintaining uh, a calm and cool mental state. I like this. The cool eye discerns men's character. The cool ear hears the intent in their speech. Cool emotions plumb others' feelings. The cool mind penetrates everything. Integrating yin and yang. Yin-yang, this very, very simple 
idea that um, the universe operates with, with the polarities of yin and yang, for me, is the single most profound idea that I've come across in my life. It's been um, a vital part of my understanding of so many things for so many years now. And one of the joys of this internal practice for me is the way that it works with yin yang in a number of ways. Um, I've talked about this, this was actually a video of me standing in a Qigong posture. I said, here, this is yin and yang. In all stillness, which is yin, there must be movement, which is yang. So as we stand in this quiet posture, we're looking for free, smooth, internal flow. Yeah? And the opposite, in all movement, there must be stillness. And so, although the body's moving, the mind is quiet and still and deep in the core of our body is stillness. Like um, they say that however big the storm is whipping up the waves in the sea, just a couple of meters down or a few meters down, the sea is calm and still. Yeah? So we hold this internal stillness even though uh, we're moving the body. So this is one way of integrating yin and yang. Another way of integrating yin and yang is balancing strength and softness. This quotation, the yang energy in people is firm, firm and strong, but firmness without restraint turns into aggressiveness, like fire rising. Yin and energy is flexible. Flexibility without support becomes too weak, like water descending. So in our practice, we need to combine strength and vigor with softness. We don't want to be too soft, and we don't want to be too strong or aggressive. That creates tension. So even when you're doing hard physical practice, yoga, qigong, bagua, you have to maintain quietness and softness. I just want to say a word about this, internal and external. Internal is yin, external is yang, uh, in relation to our mental states. If we practice the internal style, that includes most yoga, perhaps not the most vigorous forms of yoga, uh, a lot of qigong, a lot of tai chi, it's very easy, it's desirable to have internal awareness. We're aware of our body, we're aware of our breath, yes? we're fully absorbed, but what's the risk of that? Yeah? We turn inwards too much. Yeah? We become excessively inwardly absorbed and we forget about the universe that we live in. Huh? So um, it's pointed out in Chinese Qigong textbooks that people who are depressed shouldn't do too much internal practice huh? because you just increase that internal obsession. Huh? People who are depressed, particularly if they're severely depressed, should dance and run and play basketball and um, swim in the sea, yeah? you do more external. So if we want to really integrate yin and yang in our practice, we have to both be um, able to be fully internally absorbed and also able to be externally aware. And this is actually one of the advantages of Qigong particularly because traditionally it's practiced outdoors wherever possible. Yeah? So we practice uh, near tree, next to trees, near rivers, near the sea. We practice in nature. And a lot of people who've done Qigong know that a lot of the movements um, mirror natural phenomena. Yeah? We stand like a tree. Yes? We fly like a bird. Yes? We, um, practice animal forms. We become tigers, we become cranes, we become bears and deer. Huh? We um, imitate clouds. Huh? We play with waves. So this is uh, 
another really good way of balancing internal and external awareness. And there are other key yin-yang integrations, which I won't talk about, rising and descending, forward and backward, slowness and speed, coiling and uncoiling, inhaling and exhaling. Stopping before completion is, this is a theme running through um, the whole health cultivation tradition. So for example, in eating, famous Chinese saying everybody knows, eat to 70%. Uh, don't eat till you're full. In exercise, we've talked about the body should always be exercised, but don't go to extremes. Don't, don't go to the point of exhaustion. So in the internal arts, the internal martial arts, we observe this um, rule of stopping before completion. For example, when we extend the arm, we lengthen through the arm to about there, to about 80% of potential lengthening. We don't do that. We don't lock the giant. As far as the knees are concerned, we rise and fall. We never rise fully through the legs and lock the knee joint. Yes? There are various reasons for this. One idea, and I, um, I meant to bring stacks of rubber bands so we could practice stretching a rubber band to a point that feels natural and you can easily feel there's a point beyond that where you're stretching too much. It's the same with the body. Huh? Um, and the idea is that when we lock and when we extend fully, then that causes stagnation. Yes? When we coil and uncoil, that encourages free flow. Free flow, I've talked about. I won't say more now. I'd like to leave time for questions. Um, Okay, I think this might be next to last topic, the elastic body. So we talked about flexibility. You mentioned flexibility. Uh, I think the term I would like to use is elasticity. Okay. So you have this ancient idea in, in the Chinese medicine tradition of the channels, the meridians of the body. Has everybody heard? You know, if you're not acupuncturist, you might have heard of the idea of these kind of flows, lines through the body. And what do they say about them in the Chinese tradition? Well, what do they say about the meridians? They connect the bottom of the body to the top of the body, the very tip of the toe to the top of the head, right, run right through the body. They connect the left and right sides. They connect the exterior of the body to the right deep into the interior of the body. That's why you stimulate a point on the body and it can affect an internal organ. Um, and nobody's ever discovered objectively the existence of meridians or channels. But what we do know, the fascia is an anatomical entity which was ignored for several hundred years. From the time they started cutting open bodies and, and looking at them, the fascia was the stuff that got in the way of the, what they thought was really interesting. It was the soft, white, connective tissue that seemed to be everywhere in the body and you have to get rid of it, cut through it, and then you can see the muscle and then you can see the organ. And I don't know how it happened, but then at some point, not so long ago, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years perhaps, they suddenly had a rethink and they thought, what is this stuff? This stuff connects the tip of the toe to the top of the head. Huh? It connects the left side of the body to the right side of the body. It connects the outside of the body to the inside of the body. It wraps around every nerve. It wraps around every blood vessel. This is a whole body system through which fluid is transmitted and possibly electrical energy. Okay? Um, and it's described as the biological fabric that holds us together. A healthy body is described as a tensegrity structure. A tensegrity structure you can get these toys like this, where they actually sell them as kids' toys. You know, they're funny creations of sticks and balls and with rubber running through them. But the basic thing is any part of it that you move, the whole thing moves. The whole thing responds to the movement of any part. 
this is what the healthy paleo body is like. Yes? Um, but what happens? So th this fascia, which is elastic and flexible in young humans and young animals, and that is used to explain how come lambs and baby gazelles can shoot boing up in the air on the skinniest little legs with very small muscles in them. The fascia contracts, expands, boing. So the fascia in young animals is concertina shaped like this, so it can do this. But as we age, and particularly as we sit for long periods of time, and we don't move the body, whole swathes of the fascia of the body get matted. They thicken up. They get like, you know, instead of um, springy wool, you get felt. You know what felt is just when everything is squeezed down and all the hooks of the wool are stuck together and it just becomes very solid instead of being springy. This is what happens to our fascia um, through misuse and through inactivity. And what, so how can we change it? Well, we could go and lift weights. Doesn't affect the fascia barely at all. Doesn't change the condition of the fascia. We can run, we can do aerobic training. It has some effect on the fascia, but not much. What retrains the fascia and starts to restore it back to its youthful state is rhythmically and smoothly coiling and uncoiling lengthening and shortening, spiraling and twisting, multi-dimensional movement. Yeah? And perhaps because of its theoretical foundation of the channels and meridians, the Chinese exercise system specializes in this. And this is perhaps one of its great strengths and may not be so present in some of the other internal practices, is this idea of Uncoiling and coiling, uncoiling and coiling, not stretching to maximum. Rhythmically uncoiling, talking, twisting, over and over and over and over again. Yeah? Um, for hour after hour, week after week, month after month, and that is considered slowly, slowly, slowly to retrain the fascia, which gets me to a beef of mine, which is why do so many more people do yoga than do Qigong or Tai Chi? Okay. And I think the answer is, well, one thing is publicity. I mean, you can, cannot open a newspaper or particularly a, a magazine, a women's magazine or a health magazine without reading the word yoga 50 times. And it might take you a month before you come across the word Qigong. It's partly that, but also because a lot of yoga, not all of it, meets our expectations. We go to our first yoga class, we kind of stretch a lot, you know, in comparison to what we normally do. Um, we really feel we work our body and we come out and oh, I really did something. You might go to your first Qigong class and think, what? <laughs> you know, what? I have to do this for, you know, do this for half an hour? Stuff. It takes time to get it. It takes dedication. It takes daily practice. And with daily practice, as the weeks and months go by, your body starts to respond in um, very clear and definite ways, but it may not be instant. Because the fascia, to, it's said in, you know, and these are people who have studied fascia, they say to, to restore elasticity to the fascia takes 18 months to two years. Um, I, I put that there because it's a, Something I mentioned, story I mentioned in my book, I used to, when I was treating patients, sometimes people would go, well, you know, they come back and say, you told me not to eat, you, th you know, you made a recommendation about diet and I've been doing it for two weeks and this disease I've had for 20 years is not better yet. See? <laughs> so I, I'd tell them a story I heard about the American tourist who goes to the Tower of London and, and sees this beautiful, piece of grass. It's an, an old bowling green. It's absolutely perfect. It's glowing green in the sun. Every blade is just the right length. It's, it's, 
And there's an old man with a roller, and he says, American sister, he says, gee, you know, tell me, how do you get a piece of grass to look like this? And the young man says, oh, it's really, it, it's very straightforward, sir. You just water it regularly and roll it every day for 800 years. So, <laughs> um, so finally, uh, this is where I get all wacky. Um, also yin and yang, between heaven and earth. The Chinese have this saying that it's actually heaven, man, and earth, but we'll update that to heaven, human, and earth. Earth, solid. Earth is yin. We stand on yin earth. Huh? And earth is where we get rootedness and balance, sure-footedness, emotional and physical grounding. We use the word grounding. Yeah? We're grounded on earth. Yeah? That's the energy of earth. If you want to get a bit more um, philosophical, spiritual, we could say earth is historically connected to the female, to fertility and birth. Nature springs up from earth. Um, nourishment from below. Uh, when we stand like a tree, we can imagine roots going deep down into the yin earth. Um, in the kind of religious tradition, uh, you have the pre-Christian, pre-Islamic um, goddess cults with uh, like the Greek ones where goddesses are worshipped in uh, springs in the woods and caves and, and, and tombs. This is New Grange in Ireland where the dead body is taken into the womb here, uh, into the deep into the, the womb of the earth to be ready to be reborn again. Um, and of course, this what's below is also the, the source of, of our deepest unconscious and was demonized in the, certainly in the Christian, I, th I, I think possibly it's fair to say in the Judeo-Christian or in the monotheistic traditions as the underworld, hell, where the devil lives. Yes? Because the earth is matter. Um, matter and mater, mother, have the same root. Yes? So matter, physicality, is associated in the, uh, some of the monotheistic traditions with, with gross, sinful flesh. And so what is below, what is dark, has been turned into um, partly hell that lies beneath us and partly a kind of gross, potentially sinful physicality that we want to escape from up to heaven. We want to leave it behind. Yes? So that, to my mind, is, is very unbalanced. We need to understand the richness of earth and connect down to earth. And this is really interesting. The Tao Te Ching, 4th century BCE, who would ever expect a feminist text to appear in China. But it's very clear. Tao Te Ching is full of these kind of quotations. The valley spirit never dies. This is yin. It is the woman, primal mother. Her gateway is the root of heaven and earth. And it's advice, opening and closing the gates of heaven. Can you play the role of woman? Because the Tao is compared to the female which gives birth, constantly gives birth to all phenomena. And then heaven, we connect up. This sounds fanciful, but this is what we do every day in practice. When we stand, we connect downwards into earth, and then as we're rooted, we lengthen upwards into heaven. And heaven, of course, is the great universe above our heads huh? that we also live in. It's the conscious, the rational, it's discrimination, certain kinds of vision, the revealed, the outer, the vast universe, stars, planets, galaxies, and so on. And part of the beauty of this tradition is human beings are in between heaven and earth. We're the kind of conduits where heaven, the energies of heaven and the energies of earth mix and give us life. So when we practice um, Qigong, when we practice these internal forms through this deep rooting and this deep connection upwards, we connect to heaven and earth.
Last word. Also from the 4th century BCE text, you must be firm, you must be regular in your practice. Hold fast to your excellent practice. Do not let go of it. 